Continue. Okay. Okay. Uh, there she is. So, oh, and here's Lauren. Great. Okay. So today is February 10th, 2022, the Amherst Board of Health meeting. And as I open it, I will do a roll. No, I'll do the pursuant and then do the roll call. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GLC 30A section 20, this meeting of the Amherst Board of Health will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. For information on remote participation, please see the calendar entry on the Town of Amherst website. Um, there you will find the Zoom link and the telephone dial-in instructions. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means, meaning our Zoom. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the town's website an audio recording of the meeting and meeting minutes will be posted on the Amherst Board of Health website um, as soon as possible after the meeting. So I will have a roll call. Uh, Nancy, Nancy Gilbert. Uh, Maureen? Here. Steve? Here. Tim? Here. Lauren? Here. Okay, thank you. And um, Jennifer Brown, our health director is here. And is Ed here? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I am here. Uh, okay, she disappeared. Um, our uh, inspector. So the first um, order of business is to review and receive the meeting minutes from January 13th. Um, does anyone have any comments or want to make any changes, edits, and if not, may have a motion to accept them? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes. Okay, Maureen made a motion, may have a second? I can second it. Okay, and Tim seconded it. So we have a motion that's been and seconded to accept the meeting of the minutes of our January 13th, 2022 meeting. All in favor? Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Lauren? Lauren? Yes, aye. Steve? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Okay, so they were accepted. Old business. The first item on the agenda is the recombinant DNA regulations with Maureen and Steve. And you were emailed a whole lot of stuff. The draft of the new regulations, minutes of the Amherst College IBC, and the facility locations at Amherst College and Maureen and Steve, do you want to take over? Yeah, I think we are basically are giving you what we had last time with a couple of suggestions that people made. So it's the same, all the same substantive changes that we had before, but just you know, a few minor wording changes. So, you know, we think it's ready to go, but uh, we want to listen to hear what people say. I did make a little table of, of the changes. I could put it up if that's of interest, but I think people already know the main things that are there. Maybe I'll just quickly in 30 seconds. So we're going to not have uh, the lowest level of safety, biological safety level, BSL-1, regulated by us at all. Uh, we are going to forbid all BSL-4, whereas the current one allows it under some circumstances. So that's the main thing about that. And then the other things are just uh, basically allowing the community members of their institutional biosafety committee, committee to come from anywhere, not necessarily within the confines of the town of Amherst. And 
and not have I'll ask a question on that later. Oh, okay, yeah. So they'll have to register if they're doing anything at BSL two or or three, but they don't. We don't are not going to be in the business of permitting particular experiments, which is on the books, but which we really have not done, as far as I can tell. Those are some of the main changes. Thank you. I did have one question on that. Section five, number A, number two, the non-affiliate representatives on the IBC shall be nominated by the institution with notice to an approval by the Board of Health. We had talked about that they had to be in the geographic area. Do we pick that up then when their their names are submitted to us? Do you remember that discussion we had? Well, yeah, well, well I, we definitely, you know, right now it says they have to be in Amherst. And before, you know, just to give them some latitude over the last few months, we said, no, they could be in a nearby town. And, but then Maureen and I, I think felt that, you know, they're going to deal with it. I mean, they want the people to be there. They have to have a quorum. So, and in fact, it requires a certain number of people. So we just said, let the people live wherever, just not even... Let, let the institutions worry about it. Okay, so that's number two under section 5A, correct? Mm -hmm. that, yeah, okay, fine. I just wanted to, I just thought that's what it was and I just wanted clarification, fine. Thank you. It was just clarification I needed. Lauren or Tim, do you have any questions? So um, the non-affiliated representatives that means they can be anywhere from the world i mean i'm just um, we are opening a global set to choose from right <laughs> i guess I, I, i'm just saying I you know because because they have, i think they have their meetings you know they're not expecting to have their meetings remotely i, I mean if we can some I, sort of a restrict a geographical area like pioneer valley that is plenty of towns at least they will have some sort of a locational interest in towards that, you know, instead they of choosing someone there. from South America or I don't know, <laughs> India. I mean, I'm just saying you know, that you need some sort of people to know the location, have some vested interest in that ge geographical area. I'm just curious you know, if we could put some qualifiers. We could say uh, Hampshire County. Well, my, my thought is, well, if you put Hampshire County, if someone's at Bay State, then you exclude them. So you could say Western Massachusetts, but then if they want someone from Worcester, because UMass Worcester's there and all, or, or the Boston schools, do we just say Massachusetts? And I thought, well, maybe they want someone from Hartford, but I, I don't know if you want to say Massachusetts, yeah. Western Massachusetts. I, I think be somebody vested in in the in the region really you know uh, if i i mean we clearly the board is going to be able to approve these people uh, um and say they might say well geez this doesn't make any sense and does it make sense now to put some kind of boundary on it so that at least they people won't go through the motions of finding somebody from far away that doesn't seem to make sense to us i, I, I don't know do we want to say Western Massachusetts? Because someone could be living up in Wendell, you know, residing in Wendell. Right. And, and, and Franklin, Franklin County. County. Yeah. I mean, or and, even, or they you know, even in the be, school district, you know, right. right. You know, so right. you could just say Western Massachusetts, or you could say our You know, the, I, Pioneer Valley sounds good, but Pioneer that's like Valley. not well defined. <laughs> as well, Pioneer as, Valley as, goes as a, from Northfield <laughs> to Springfield. Right. And how far leader. apart, how wide is it? <laughs> All the hill towns. Why do we have to limit it geographically? Because many people come here or move here maybe for a job and they might live somewhere else that's not, you know, in the geographical area. But like you were saying, they, they might have an interest somehow or find out about this area somehow and not necessarily be living in the actual area. I think the point was that they know the valley, that they know the air, geographical area, that they're not. Because they live here or how would they know? I mean, you could live somewhere well, if else. If they live here, they would know it. 
Steve or Maureen, do you want to address that? I don't know. I think it's it's like a community member with some knowledge of these issues, but also not part of Amherst College. It's it's like it's not their job to be doing this. It's their interest in making sure it's being done well, I guess, um, and and protecting the community. Um, in, should something arise, so I I, I guess I, it's kind of confusing about what. I think currently it's uh, they have a physician, retired physician who lives in Amherst and a, a person who uh, teaches at the middle school, but is also strongly affiliated with UMass in, in science and science education. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I think that's work, but I think they, the problem had been that it wasn't always easy to find somebody from Amherst itself, even though you know, it could have been from, you know, if we thought about Leverett or Belchertown or, or, Hadley Hadley or, or whatever that seemed, that would seem fine. So I don't know if just leaving it that way and having people who <laughs> in the future figure it out or just say the region, uh, but that's very vague. Um, I, I think, you know, if Western Mass might be a, broad enough but also mm -hmm. includes reasonable i think that finally when they do this final selection of that they will probably have commuting distance you know you cannot have people <laughs> five hours from now to come to attend a meeting you know <laughs> they could do it in right. zoom now As but i think you know right? <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i think we can leave right. it at uh, western mass and then uh, it might be a smaller distance in you know, a commuting distance they will choose you know? so, Okay, so we'll change it to the, the non-affiliated. Again, is that, what does that mean? It's like Hampshire, Franklin, and Berkshire counties? Hampton, too. Oh, Hampton, too. Yeah, Hampton, Hampshire, the three Bionary Valley counties and Berkshire. That's Western Massachusetts. Yeah. Since we do have to sign off on them, I think if we make it, if it's a little bit vague, they'll just say, well, we don't want to push that because they might not accept them. So they're, they'll be reasonable. At least the one institution that has to register will be reasonable. I don't know about in the future. So maybe we just say Western mm -hmm. Massachusetts. That's fine. Okay. Is everybody happy with that? Yeah, that was my only when I looked at it. Thank you for doing this work. No problem. Okay. And I, like I have, that a, you have reviewed every five years, or or more often, as or me. more often, yes. But the old one said one year every year, and it hadn't been reviewed in ten years. <laughs> Tim, you had one more. Oh, I just a quick question for um, right now. We only have Amos College under this IBC requirements and stuff. Is it right? Uh, does it include? future colleges or Hampshire College or I'm just curious, you know. Well, it, Hampshire it was anyone, in the past. It includes everybody who's doing work that requires biosafety level two practices. Two okay. or three, biosafety three. level two or three. That would be a private company that might want to move here and any college. Hampshire has not done this. They had, they said they had a couple of student projects in sometime in the distant past that would be BSL one. But they've never had BSL two and don't intend to. Okay. So the next step would be to for us to agree on this and then post a hearing. Right. And I forget now what exactly. I mean, obviously, we want to provide the text of this to the public, right? Or, or do we just to say the items that we're going, we're going to change? Like with the tobacco, I don't think we provided a complete text of what we were considering as far as I can. Yes, we remember. did. We, we posted the whole entire and okay, oh, good. the whole but, regulation go, gets out. Okay, oh yeah, the entire regulation gets posted. Posted where? Jen does that. Jen, where do you post it? Jen, Jen or the, the director sets up 
the the hearing for us in the past. I've never set up a hearing. Jen, are so, you there? Yeah, so go to the town calendar. Is, is that what you're saying, how to post a, a public hearing? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we would we would post it to the town calendar and then um, put it on our web page. And we send letters to the Amher Amherst College who's, who already have that anybody who's been involved with it like when we did the tobacco it was sent out to all the people who sold tobacco mm -hmm. so amherst college is the only maybe out of courtesy we should send it to hampshire college mm -hmm. because it said it lets them off the hook if they do have a bso on project they don't have to register yeah, right mm -hmm. yeah so, okay. i can't i don't know anybody else that it would affect right as of now okay so what i'll do is to change the uh, residence requirement to western massachusetts and then i'll i'll just leave off all the signature part at the very end and the date and stuff like that okay and send that to jennifer and jennifer you will put it on the website okay well, no well, no there's a whole thing about having the hearing and and um it was always the health director who set it up. Did, yeah, Jen, I can, you set it I up can look. Hearing? I can look into that and, and okay. figure that out but with it, open it meeting. Be, yeah, it yeah. has to be put in the newspaper. You know, I think it specifically says it must be in the newspaper. Right. Yeah. So, so do we want to do this for our March meeting, or do we want to do this for our April meeting? March. Okay. So, Jen, are you all set to get this all set for our March meeting? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, do we need to vote on our? No. No. It, Not it's now. after the hearing we vote. Right. Yeah, right. After the hearing we vote. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. On here. So the community assessment update. So for phase one, which is a all quantitative data, no interactive human data. We have put together a team of, and it's a small team. Phase two would have a different team. It's myself, Anita Saro, who was involved with the reparations assessment. We have two students, Bailey Glenn, who is a, a second semester master's student in the School of Public Health, and Emily Connors, who is a senior in a four plus one. So once she completes her bachelor's degree this May, she immediately goes to the master's program in the fall. And um, Lillian representing the health department. Um, uh, Anita and I interviewed them on uh, Monday and we found them to be very good very excited and we're going to meet with them again on february 23rd to have them meet jen and lillian also i have sent out emails to both the reparations committee that's doing a assessment and the council on aging aarp with uh, maureen Polak from the planning department they're doing through the aging and dementia friendly Amherst, they're doing a senior assessment. So I sent out an, an email asking that we work together rather than in silos uh, when we can. Um, but I haven't heard, I heard back from Michelle Miller, who's on the, the reparations piece, and they are going to be using the Donahue Institute out of UMass for the African-American Black Census. Um, and I haven't heard anything from the Council on Aging yet. Any questions? Okay, so that's where we are. And we will have a written and oral report at the uh, in April from the students. And it, the data is going to be collected by census tract. I went in and I don't know if everything is yet on 
the US 2020 census data, some of it, and I spoke with a couple of people and they said, no, not, not everything is up yet. So they're gonna do the best they can given that the government hasn't put all the data in yet for easy access. Thanks for doing all this, Nancy. You make it sound so simple. I know just how much you've been working on this and pulling it together. Thank, Thank you. you. But I'm so excited about these students and especially with the Emily, who's the four plus one, because I talked to her about working smart. And if she could continue this into phase two as part of her master's work, um, I'd help her any way she could do that. But she seemed pretty excited to stay on. So she would start this semester and continue all of next year is my hope. That's great. Okay. So new business, Mission Cantina and mask mandate compliance. So Jen and Ed. Okay. Me to just go ahead and make a report? Just Jen? go right ahead. I don't know if Jen, okay. if you want to start anything to introduce this, or do you want to just want to give it to Ed to go with it? I think, Ed, if you want to start, we can sure. fill in if we need okay. to. Okay. So I, I made some notes, some bullet points, if you will, and I'll read through that. Um, so this is a report to you as the board regarding recent actions taken um, in response to complaints from the public and from our own inspectors of no masking by employees of Mission Cantina. Um, consistent with all masking complaints received directly either to the COVID concerns line or made directly to the health or inspections department. The inspections department reached out to Mission Cantina a total of 12 occasions since June of 2020 to follow up on complaints or on our own observations of employees not masking. On the last two of these occasions, during the recent surge of COVID-19 cases, fines were assessed. On 1-13-2022, two employees were observed unmasked when the restaurant was open and patrons were present and no medical exemptions were on record at the health department. This led to the issuance on 1-19-2020, or excuse me, 2022, of a town bylaw violation ticket in the amount of a single $50 first violation. An email that I wrote that day to the owner, Sam Koshin, of Mission Cantina stated that future compliance checks will cite every instance observed of non-exempt employees working in public areas of the restaurant. So following up to that, or uh, from that, on 1-21-2022, another compliance check found four unmasked employees working in the presence of patrons at the restaurant. And subsequently on 1-24, a ticket was issued for the second violation, $100, as well as the third, fourth, and fifth violations at $200 each for a total of $700. Again, the owner was asked to inform all employees who wish to exercise the medical exemption to the mask order to submit documentation to the health director. None had been received at the time of the ticketing. On 127, 2022, third compliance check found no violations, but the inspector's approach was noticed. We decided to pause on compliance checks at that time and seek the advice of the Board of Health. Following that, after several reminders, the owner did meet a late deadline on 2-2-2022, February 2nd, to submit payment and renewal application materials for the current, the 2022 food service establishment license for the restaurant. Mm. The last two things I'll add are some relevant sections um, in the food code. Um, the 2013 FDA food code is the um, one that the Massachusetts Sanitary Code references. In section 8-304.11, responsibilities of the permit holder the code compels the establishment to comply with directives of the regulatory authority, including orders, warnings, and other directives issued by the regulatory authority in regard to the permit holder's food establishment, 
or in response to community emergencies. Also, in 105 CMR 590.0088, which references the 2013 Food Code Section 8-303.20, and this is the state minimum sanitation standards for food establishments, it states that number, number nine, failure to comply with local regulations and ordinances related to the operation of the facility can be taken into uh, consideration as cause for non-renewal. Um, the last thing I will mention is that we do have a strong statement made on the 24th of January to members of town government um, stating that he, no, he intends to no longer comply with Amherst Board of Health collective decisions. So I guess I would temper this a little bit in the sense that since we decided to not go in and do further compliance checks, we haven't received more complaints um, from the public. Um, so we don't have any indication, you know, independently whether compliance is in place or not, but we've actions taken to this point indicate that it's unlikely. Um, would remain to be seen. So, and that's my report. I'll give it to you in the current context of time and circumstances. I'm happy to answer your questions. And would you repeat what you said when you started talking about the license? I, it was a little bit, I think there was a gap there. So you said that- uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Were you trying to keep up with me? <laughs> no, well, yeah, I think there was a, yeah. a Zoom just cut out for a sec. So the, when you started to talk about the license on 222, February 2nd, I guess. What, what was it that you said there? Oh, okay. So we have been working with establishments in town to make sure we got everybody possible renewed and um, reminders had been sent out uh, initially when everybody was asked to renew. Uh, I think that was in November with a December 1st deadline. And following up, um, there was two reminders, I think in January and a week before February 2nd, I sent a direct, we reminded anybody that was left and specifically to Mission Cantina that we needed the materials by the following Wednesday. And we did receive those. Now, Ed, when you said payment and renewal was received, was that payment for the fines or just payment for the license? Payment for the license. So the the fines have not been paid for the mask. Masks. That's correct. Yeah, okay. and they are. Um, that step taken was. It's not a, a money making effort. Certainly for the town, right. it's a. It's an attempt to. Make a Educate. point to um, yeah, to imp compel compliance. Mm -hmm. We've we. All through, the period of time following the closure of restaurants, the reopening. Um, outdoor dining, whenever we have had a complaint from the public or um, a town employee or uh, amongst the group of inspectors, if we've had an issue of non-masking, um, we followed up in an educational step. Uh, these were the first fines that we've assessed during the pandemic. So you received se several um, uh, complaints or questions and you made other visits to other food establishments related to the uh, masks? Yeah, most, most, um, and certainly with mission, uh, most of the early uh, replies were just emails or phone conversations, um, which was consistent with what we did whenever possible with all the restaurants. Um, and um, in a very few cases, we went out and actually visited in person, but our first step would be to talk to the manager or the owner and to, as you said, make an educational um, attempt to, to, to reach compliance. So and I would say that overall in Amherst, we have had a lot of support, both from establishments and the public. Could you clarify, what is the status of their license renewal now? We have the materials in hand. We are reviewing it, if you will.
I know I received, uh, someone contacted me about uh, uh, people not wearing masks for the, the takeout window and they were concerned and I directed them to, call, that might've been the COVID call, line call. I, I suggested they, they issue a complaint to the um, health department. So you are asking us for guidance in relationship to? Yeah, the pandemic relate, remains a complex dynamic situation. Um, we have exercised a lot of judicious judgment, I think all through the, the course of it, you know, by making mostly educational attempts for compliance. Um, and this restaurant we gave many chances to. Um, we've had, you know, certainly feedback many times from the owner that he feels as though public health measures have been excessive that, um, you know, and he's, he's, I would say he's spoken with genuine feeling about the difficulties that restaurants have been put through by the pandemic and by the, the measures that have been taken to try to ensure the public's health. Um, yeah, I know. That, in, yeah. In that, earlier that, board meetings on um, occupancy numbers, um, and then in our December meeting on masks and whether we were going to have vaccine requirements, um, the monkey bar has, has often been at our meetings and asked questions. And I know last year on um, occupancy, the, the spoke have, have come to meetings. Um, and spoke, and I think we've tried to be very sensitive um, to the restaurants, knowing how difficult it is right now for them. But it's difficult for um, <laughs> lots of people. We don't want to put people out of business, but there are some safety and health measures that we feel are important um, for the safety of the public. Other members, what are your thoughts? Are we, are we advising about the license renewal today, Ed? Is that what you want to hear from us? Or? Um, I, I think mainly what we wanted to do was we, we felt as though it was high time to make sure that you had some of the details of this. It's sure. been going on since June of 2020, I would say. And we have had um, you know, ongoing communication with the owner. Um, but as of yet, we have not achieved compliance. Um, we have issued the fines. Um, it is not a widespread problem in town. Um, we so would not wearing masks uh, during the pandemic because we have made that a public health issue and regulation mean that they are not um, following our um, sanitary code amendments because that's, uh, is that what's been happening? Well, currently what they're doing is they're not following a directive of the Board of Health, which is clearly okay. a violation of the food code. Um, it, it, the code also states that it can be taken into consideration when considering renewal. Okay. And, you know, simply put, that's that's what we're doing. Um. So before renewing their license, we would, and, we like, and we've worked with many, many restaurants and, and the health director and, and you all have worked with many restaurants to make sure they're in compliance mm -hmm. um, throughout the years. We would want them to show that they are using the masks appropriately, according to public health safety, and they would pay their fines. Mm -hmm. Would that, those are two issues related to whether they get their license renewed, correct? Is that what you're looking for? Well, I mean, clearly those are, are firm points that we could stand on. Um, mm -hmm. There have been some discussions with the owner about, um, he's stated a number of times that he would go to takeout only and uh, 
consulting with Rob Mora, the building commissioner, with the language of the mask order, it would appear that it directs itself towards establishments where the public enters. Um, and that, it, and it doesn't specifically speak to employees, actually. Um, it's possible that one could consider uh, takeout only where the public does not enter the restaurant. Um, that would probably entail a discussion of whether that meets the spirit and, you know, is that actually enforceable? That, that's not a violation of your, of your order. Um, the complaint I received was about the takeout only person did right. not have a mask on and this person did not feel safe uh, um, doing that and said, right. well, they weren't ever going again and, and what, and then they, they issued a complaint to the town. Mm -hmm. So that even if it's takeout only, the takeout person, while there's a mask mandate would need to be wearing a mask, correct? Well, are there are ways of doing takeout if you just leave it like out on a table or something when the person comes that you would, you know, you wouldn't have to have that interaction, but that seems extreme, like an extreme measure for the, for them to take in this light of this to me, but um, it's not, but that's my feelings about wearing a mask, not their feeling about wearing a mask. Um, yeah, Lauren had a hands up in. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was thinking at the same time. Thank you. Um, I I think when we had the um, open discussion um, meeting about uh, restaurants um, being mandated to like for the public to show um, some kind of vaccine um, ID or vaccinated ID um, to go into certain food restaurants, um, Mission Cantina was on that call and called in. Um, and to me, I, I just wonder, is it, is it the owner who is just not wanting to comply or is it the employees that are not wanting to comply? And, you know, from my understanding, you know, it's a protection for, you know, both people, the public and the employees. So if you're interaction interacting with you know the public because you work in a restaurant you to me you would want to have that protection of the mask so i i just would wonder you know where is the non-compliance coming from is it sure. the employees that do not want to comply or is it the owner who maybe they're just having bad business and they just don't care i, I don't know that's just some of my thoughts. So we, as inspections um, personnel, we haven't interacted with the employees. We've interacted with, you know, we go and we do a check or we respond to a claim, complaint by talking to the owner as the person in charge mm -hmm. of the business. Um, and earliest responses that we got at the end of last summer as the mask order, I think, was going into effect um, were... Uh, first, to, to state broadly that the employees were exercising the medical mask exemption. And that what we replied to that by saying that documentation was necessary and further clarified that and repeated it over time that the health director is in a position that she's legally uh, enabled to uh, verify a document from a physician or an RN. The Jen knows the details of this for sure. Um, to, you know, to ascertain whether an exemption is valid um, and that there's not a compromise of, um, you know, the medical confidentiality of the records, that this is um, an occasion when that's appropriate and HIPAA does not prevent the review of records like that. So we've informed the owner as the responsible person in charge to make sure employees know that they need to submit documentation to, in order to take a mask exemption. 
his reply has been that he does not believe that he has the authority to do that under HIPAA laws, that they are protected documents. And as their employer, he cannot request them to do that. And we've replied to please inform your employees that they need to exercise this step that is part of the mask exemption. Um, so that, and that's been repeated since August a number of times. Most times that we've written, each time we've written a, uh, a violation ticket that was emphasized. And uh, Jen, maybe and you can I think tell us, have you received everything any? perfectly here. Oh, I'm sorry, I go think, ahead. Steve, what did you say? I just, okay, I just want to say that I thought at the end that you've done everything perfectly here with incredible patience and doing it correctly. I would just say in my view of thinking about what the mask mandate says, I really think that it does not apply to a takeout window because it says indoor spaces accessible to the public. So if the restaurant goes to a full takeout mode, you know, that, that it's really maybe the board's fault for not thinking about that. But I think that I can't see how the mask mandate could possibly cover that. Of course, a customer would be very justified in saying, I'm not going to go there under those circumstances, but I don't think we could say it's not an indoor space accessible to the public if it is through a window. I don't, I don't think. Right, if it's a window. It, the way it is now, if you want to pick up an order at Mission Cantina, as you walk in the door, you wait at the yeah. cash register, you're face to face with the person, and that might take a while. Yeah, that's, um, that's, you know, I yeah. think that could be modified, obviously, to make it be like no contact. Um, or like minimal, hand, you know, handing through an opening in the building, but it's not the way it is at the moment. But that would mean the bar and the restaurant would be closed to the public, yeah. just take right. it. Home. Right. Well, I guess what's the restaurant? Pita Pockets that were doing just takeout for a long time, and they would just come to their like a half door and deal with the public that way. That but they were all wearing masks too. So I mean, but but there's a structure that would work, I think. And that's what Antonio's did too. Yeah, I don't go to many places, but I've been to those too. <laughs> I, I was just gonna add that um, I know people still feel different ways about, you know, mandates and vaccinations and so forth. But um, when you're handling food, you could still cough on the food, breathe on the food. So I just don't, I don't get like why a restaurant and the owner wouldn't want to comply with masking. Um, and just lastly, like if they're, if, if they're going to just do takeout only, would they still have to pay the fines first? Nancy, can I just tell you that there's someone with a raised hand? I don't know if oh, you okay. want to well, after let's see. Um, um, okay, does anyone else want to speak before we open up to, to the public? So is this the is this the public comment period for all issues? Well, no, this is just about the masks. In the oh, in okay. mission, this is just about mission cantina. Just about Mission Cantina. Just about Mission Cantina. Okay, that's good. Okay. So okay. can I ask a clarifying question? Mm -hmm. uh, I know Ed mentioned it's from August 2020, is right? Some of the violations. June 2020. Uh, June 2020. Yeah. And yeah. are all these violations related to takeouts? Or no. was there any okay, indoor indoor dining issues? Yes, there have been indoor dining issues. There was the, well, they, the, the specific ones that we've been working on most recently have followed the um, implementation of the mask order. Um, and there was a, a little, uh, there was a flurry, if you will, of complaints in late December and January. Um, uh, Nancy mentioned there was a next door posting, which was um, 
two of the complaints that came into Nextdoor actually came into the Board of Health too. Um, and I think actually maybe more than that, but we followed up on both of those. Um, going back, if we go back to when um, the inspections department, the building commissioner worked with many restaurants, including Mission Cantina to establish outdoor dining. And the only issues we had during the period of outdoor dining, and that would be back in the summer of 2020, um, were uh, people, all the servers, there were no complaints of people serving outside at Mission Cantina without masks. Um, that was consistent. There were people who commented that they observed that people inside were not masked. Um, but it's the period of concern really, and that has led to the tickets being issued, has been since the mask mandate. And then especially um, we had discussions between the building commissioner, Jen Brown and I about uh, the during the surge here, um, what would be our response to this growing number of complaints. And so that's when we, we moved to the compliance checks. Okay. Does, does anyone else have questions for Ed? Okay, so Sam Kohan has his hand up. Let's have him speak here. Jen, do you want to? Yep, so okay, Sam, you. if you can unmute yourself. Okay, Sam, do you want to state your full name? Yeah, this is Sammy. I'm the owner of Mission Cantina. How are you guys? Okay. Are you, can you see me or do I only see you? I don't know how this works. I make tacos, so. Um, we only, see you, we don't see you because you don't have your camera. Okay, on. okay, so so you can hear me. We can hear you. All right, mm -hmm. so can I, can I just, can I just, um, as the business owner of 10, 10 plus years, uh, describe what it's been like for the last two years uh, of the pandemic? Are you willing to listen to that? Yes, but keep it contained you know okay well 2015 2016 2017 2018 2019 each year did better than the last so we were a restaurant and a business that was going in the upward in the upward trend 2020 2021 we lost two million dollars we lost more than half of our business 80 percent of our employees do you guys understand this yes I mean, I'm not, I'm not asking for sympathy or empathy, but do you understand this is one business in your town, in the south, south part of your town that had nothing going on until we got there, okay? We're talking $2 million in sales. So part of that has driven me to do a lot more research in all my free time being closed and having very few employees to deal with. So uh, let me make something clear to you guys as far as permits and licensing fees goes, all my licenses are paid in full for 2022, except for the health department. So the cash, the, the checks have been cashed, okay? Except for this latest $300 fee to the town for my food license. Who's the scientist on the board? Is there a scientist on this board? We just listen. We don't really answer. We, we just. I, 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 you don't answer questions. That's great. Who is there a scientist on this board? We're just waiting and listening to your statement. Well, I have I have questions for you. You, you guys are discussing my business and I have questions for you. Are you willing to answer them? So is there someone qualified to answer my questions during public? Let me read you this. According to the um, guidelines and holding meetings pursuant to act extending certain COVID measures, June 16th, 2021, open meeting laws do not require that public bodies allow public comment or public participation during meetings. The manner that public bodies may choose to accept comment is outside the scope of the open meeting law. So we allow you to make comments. Okay, but is there anyone on this board willing to answer questions? Or, 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 or even better, how do I file a grievance with questions? Do I have to go to surety bonds? Should we go to public official bonds? Who, who's bonded on this committee? We are, we are talking about your mask man, the masks. Can you please right. keep- Okay, yes. 
I can Keep I can, your comments to the mask, please. Sure, sure. So the understanding that I've had with the town via me asking my employees, violating my employees' civil rights via HIPAA, which is a past presidential signed law, okay, not a mandate from a town or a state. I am not allowed to ask my employees, the very few that I have left, by the way, to show me their documents that are personal and private, and that's covered under HIPAA. Now, on the other hand, you as a board are allowed to do that under, circumst under certain circumstances. And I've invited Ed via email, I have them all, to please come down to the restaurant at a scheduled time and violate my employees' rights by asking them to produce papers regarding their personal health documents. He declined multiple times. I'm not allowed to ask that question. I'm not allowed to ask you if you come into my restaurant with a dog or an animal, why you have that and to show me papers. It's the same rule. It's a law that has been passed and has been signed into law by a sitting president. Do you follow me? Thank you for your comments. You have not addressed the fines or more of the mask. Um, the, the, the fines, the fines have appeals attached to them, which I will take to the fullest extent. Okay. okay. At this stage of the game with your mask mandates, are any of you paying attention to what's going on in the news? Because every state is lifting their mask mandates all throughout this country. What are you going to do about the mask mandates? Find a business that just lost $2 million. Is that your plan? has been a member of this community for 10 years that has two people in El Salvador right now that we sponsored to get citizenship. Enough is enough. I've had it. You guys won't answer questions, but you'll pass down mandates and you'll pass down fines to me. Okay. Okay. You need to wake you. up. Thank you very much for your comments, Sam. Thank you very much for not answering my questions. Okay, so we'll go back to the board. Does the board have any other comments, questions? Ed, do you wanna make any comments? Mm, no, I, I think I've, I've given you an overview of the situation and um, we'll continue to rely on the board and Rob Mora and Jen Browns direction on following up on this. Okay, yes, and, and Jen is our, our agent. Um, and um, we'll, we'll work through, through Jen as our agent. Nancy, I just, I need to ask, um, are you allowing more public comment? Oh, sure. Or does that wait to the end? So we'll wait that to the end um, during a, a regular public comment. Okay. Time. So, okay, so that'll be maybe 620 or so at the end of the agenda. Yes, okay. thank you. I, I have trouble keeping all these pieces on okay. yeah. Zoom straight. Okay, so we will go to um, our next agenda item and anyone who wants to speak um, can speak during the public comment. So I had the mosquito control put on, let's see, because I received two pieces of information. One was from uh, Elena Cohen. And today at our same time while well, this is going on, there was a listening session on from the mosquito control task force on um, mosquito spraying. We also received a copy of a letter that Senator Joe Comerford sent. Um, I don't know if everybody got it, but it was um, related to mosquito spraying and local opt-out process. Um, and she wrote to the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Um, 
asking about our opt-out process. And if you remember, I believe it was last summer with the opt-out, we decided to go with the Pioneer Valley Control Group. Is that, do I have a correction? PVMCD, Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. Yeah, but it Thank you. Um, I looked it up. <laughs> Thank you for opt out. Also, um, with the with Elena Cohen, I looked up, and there's a mosquito control for the 21st Century Task Force, and there's a subcommittee uh, related to the Office of Energy and uh, Environmental Affairs, and they are looking at the opt out. Um, so I just wanted to bring to your attention that there is work on mosquito spraying local opt-out, but I, we haven't been asked for voting or any um, action, but I wanted you to be aware that the um, mosquito pesticide spraying local opt-out process is being examined um, and we do have our membership and I wanna make sure with Jen that the town has renewed our membership um, to that group. So I did a little digging, you know, being a, a new it's director. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so trying to get up to speed with where we are and I wanna thank the staff that helped me um, sort of uh, untangle this. So <laughs> as I'm, I'm learning this, um, it looks like May 17th, the town council um, voted um, zero uh, to um, become part of the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District and opt out of the state reclamation and mosquito control board. Um, so to do that, there's quite a process, you know, there's like six steps to do. So that fulfilled the first and second step. We got the petition, the town council voted to go ahead and do that. But from our records, we're just not seeing if, if we became a member. And I know that sounds like it should be easy to ascertain that. So I'm not sure of our status of where we were, um, but going forward, it's gonna be a decision we're gonna to need to make. Do we wanna join the PVMCD? It's $5,000 per year to do that. So that's where we are right now. So I'm not sure where we were, but this is where we are now. So what are the steps we wanna take? So this is something I'm beginning to understand. And so what are my next steps? So is this something that I go to the town manager about, um, do we have the finances? Is this what we still wanted? Yes, we voted for it in May. Um, can we renew this? Is this still what the town wants? So I still need to do a little bit of homework. So you know, you know, we, the board recommended the council <clears throat> that the town join the group because the 5,000 is not some kind of random thing. It, it comes with services. Yes, it's an a la carte kind of service. Um, yeah. We can say, uh, no, we don't want larvicide, but we want this, or we don't want any of that, or we want it optional, but we want assessment data so we can yeah. make that decision. Right, and they do the mosquito trapping and, and assessing yeah. whether they're carrying EE. -E -E. mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So, and <clears throat> Nancy, are you aware that the that uh, Senator Comerford's email asks boards of health to support the changes that they're considering. And we, although we couldn't do it in person because they're meeting right now, right. we will accept uh, submission up until February 15th, I think it is. And I did send in the email of just a draft of something we might want to send. I don't know if you saw that. Just to support yeah. what, what everything that Senator Comerford's saying sounds exactly right. Me. Mm -hmm. And it seems that none of the people who did try to uh, apply to be exempted were actually al allowed to be exempted. So oh, yes, it, quite, quite it wasn't people. sure. I think this is part of what Joe Comerford and other people are working on is right. what do you have to do to be have, have an exemption from the yeah. state? 
Yeah, no, what, what the, the situation control. is that all of the people who applied who were in what the state considers low risk districts were approved to mm -hmm. opt out and none of the people that were in higher risk districts were approved. Or even moderate. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't get the opt out. So I, I would hope we would just send a quick thing to them saying that we support what what uh, Senator Comerford said and be specific. I can put it up on the screen if you want, but we can just do it later. So would, would the board like Steve to send a letter in support of this to Senator Joe Comerford? You want to see it? You want to see the text? I can do it. Yeah. Or do you want to read? How long is it? Uh, I, I don't have it up on mine yet right now. I don't think I can share the screen. So but it just says we yeah. approve the changes. I mean, the changes recommended are some sort of a lead time. Is this the main request? Lead time for stakeholders to be involved in making addition or is it what the senator is proposing? It's more than that. It's I, it's complicated, but it is mostly to make clear what the criteria are. If there are there criteria besides the risk level, because if it's only the risk level, there's no point in having an application with taking the time. It's quite time consuming to write out. You have to have a complete plan as to what you're going to do and so on. So that would mostly for them to clarify what the criteria are is will be the key to make it more open. Transparent. And that we have a plan, we have an alternative plan, and that's what we are hoping through the um, PVMCD. Mm -hmm. Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. Maureen? I support sending that. So should as we, as well. Okay, so why don't we have a vote that we, I'll make a motion that we have Steve send the letter of support to Senator Comerford on the uh, mosquito spraying local opt out, opt out process. As would you like to make it, send it to the, the group that's reviewing yes. the, the law, yeah. Do you, why don't you make the motion and I'll second it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> The board supports the efforts to um, re to improve and modernize the mosquito control process in Massachusetts. I second it. So I'll have the board vote. Maureen, do you support? Yes. Steve, do you support? Yes. Tim? Aye. Lauren? Yes. And Nancy, aye. Okay, so we all support it. Thank you very much, Steve. I was going through this today. Thinking, uh. Okay, so director's COVID updates. All right. So let me uh, talk about a little bit what's going on today. And these are statistics and data that I'm getting from Maven. Uh, the Massachusetts Virtual Epidemiological Network, and some information from the Interactive Board for the DPH. Right now, we have 536 active people in isolation. Overnight, we had 130 patients, new cases come in. So we're still going at a pretty steady clip here. If you look at the interactive dashboard for um, DPH, you can see that the cases, the case counts are coming down. That's the trend. I don't know how accurate that is if we are not reporting rapid antigen tests anymore. So that may not include all of the true cases, but the trend is it's coming down. But it's also mirror, mirroring that is the hospitalization rate is coming down as well. So it's, I hope you can hear me. So we're, we're, get, we're on the right path. The trend is down, but we're still high. Those numbers are still high um, for hospitalizations. So when we start talking about these, this data, and I know the mask mandate is a very important topic and it should be, 
um, especially with Governor Baker um, announcing that the statewide indoor mask mandate for schools will expire in February. You know, what I started thinking about is what is going to be our metric? And that's a really thing, important thing. I want to be very, um, I want people to know the process. I want the people to know the rigor and, you know, just be transparent with it. But there's not one metric. So it's a combination of things that we're looking at. So what I did was I went back and I looked at where were we in August to make the on-ramp to ask for this mandate to go on. So where we were in August was um, August 2nd, for example, there were five cases in isolation. So today there's 347. The 14 day incident rate had been uh, 1.4, but then started climbing 3.2 and it's been climbing ever since then. So, our vaccine rate at that time, I think, and I'm not sure about this, was about 75%, and now we're up to 88. So I think about those things that got us here. So what's going to get us out? So we need to look at the local rate of transmission, and that can be calculated different ways. There's different things that work for different communities. For example, I don't believe percent positivity may work for Amherst because we do a lot of testing here. I know they're using that in Boston. But if you look at the case count, that's something we need to do. The case is coming in. If we look at our 14-day um, incidence rate, um, if we were 1.4 when we started going on, right now we're 77. We need to see that really start coming down. But the other thing I think we need to think about is um, <clears throat> vaccination rate. So we have ours calculated 88% for the general population. But what I'd like to see before we start really talking about this mass mandate being reduced from a mandate to an advisory is at least getting the opportunity for the six month to four year olds opportunity to be vaccinated. So this is something that's going to be offered. Um, I believe it's the 14th. Um, it's starting through the process, the FDA, the CDC, it jumps back and forth. But if we can maybe give five weeks to at least for people to have the opportunity to vaccinate this young group, you know, all these things combined along with some education, because, you know, we're definitely moving towards this model of personal responsibility and people deciding what their best practice is, but we need to protect the vulnerable people as well. So I think with all of these things, you know, we're, we're getting there, we know masks are gonna come off and how can we educate people to get ready for this? So I just want people to know that I think we're, we're getting there and it'll be a few more weeks. If we start thinking about April, um, it's going to be summer, it's going to be people outside. I think that's something that we can start really thinking about and opening up and having more of a discussion. So that's where I am with my thinking. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone has anything they want to contribute. Comments from the board? Um, can I just yeah. ask a question? As you're seeing these cases, is there a pattern about where they're coming from or has that changed in any way? I know you've said in the past few months that it's usually been gatherings within families or friends, but I yeah. didn't know if that's different. You know, I saw the reports from the Linda Manor nursing home and I didn't know if there were any issues of that nature that you were having to deal with. Not I'm, not I'm aware of. These are small gatherings that, that mm -hmm. is occurring. And I think it's the last time I looked, it was like 44% was between the age of, of uh, 17 and 21. Then there's smattering elsewhere. So um, that's the high school senior, college freshman, middle, a little up group. Yeah. High school um, college. I had a question. Warren? Yes. Um, I I am uh, wondering if we wouldn't have to attach the 
um, lowering of the mandate um, to advisory, um, why it would have to be connected to the, the um, population that has the group you said six months to four year old that hasn't been um, vaccinated yet because I know from the, you know, radio um, information, talk radio information, NPR, um, the coverage that they do on um, COVID and, and vaccination um, mandates is that there's a, still like this idea of a growing, you know, concern or fear of parents who have children in this age group that they want their children to get vaccinated, vaccinated but um, I think there's another, you know, another attitude or feeling that, you know, the vaccinations are not good for this age group and, um, you know, parents don't want to give their children vaccinations and also for, you know, people who um, would be considered minorities or people of color who may not still like understand all of the medical information or you know the medical reasonings um for for the vaccinations um it's oftentimes that you know it's it's portrayed that we just are accepting of you know any kind of medicine that you know based on like fear of you know getting sick or or so forth so i just I just am a little concerned about like lifting a mandate because you know we we feel that you know this there's a certain group that still isn't vaccinated and just to remember that there's um, parents and community members that may not feel like it's appropriate for this age group. I said I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer that. You know, specifically, but you know, it's this combination of what we're looking at. So I was thinking that five weeks would at least uh, give the um, people that wanted to vaccinate their their children um, that opportunity to get the first dose, second dose, and then immunity after two weeks. And we're not looking for an actual threshold that so many people do it, but it's that opportunity. Are you, <clears throat> Jennifer, yeah. are you factoring in the other issue that the you know skeptics tend to raise, which is that the the uh, pandemic is sort of evolving towards benignness to some extent, as shown mm -hmm. by the Omicron mm -hmm. variant, and so just to use raw numbers of infections or incidence rate, uh, you know, you have to also take into account that supposedly it is less serious, and so. You know, we don't have mask mandates for other things that are not that serious. Yeah, yeah. I think that hospitalization um, rate is something that I think is important to keep looking at. Um, uh, Cooley Dickinson, um, for example, looking back at August, um, there were nine COVID ER visits. And then last week at Cooley Dickinson, there were 29 COVID visits. Um, Back in August, 103 beds of 126 beds were used. Now there's 119 beds. So there's still a high capacity of, that are, that are of inpatients. Um, so we want to make sure that there's availability uh, of workforce and beds in the hospitals. Jen, when you said you say there's 113 people in the hospital with COVID in Cooley Dickinson? No, this is just bed occupancy. Yeah. 11 patients um, are inpatient with COVID. Did I mix those numbers up? No, I, just, I just didn't understand. So yeah, there's, so yeah. In, in August, how many were hospitalized with COVID and how many are hospitalized now? In August, zero were hospitalized with COVID. Okay, okay. Now there are 11 and I, I apologize if yeah, I- Yeah, that's good, okay, okay. So that's something I think is really important. It's the number of beds and it's the workforce being able to care for them. Um, but also yeah. the workforce being able to 
care for anybody else that has a medical emergency, if they don't have the bed or the staff. Uh, so if, if the ICU beds are all filled or three quarters away filled with COVID patients and you have a massive heart attack, you might not get a bed in the ICU. So those are the things that we have to be careful of that the general public that might not have COVID can get care and treatment at Cooley Dickinson. There are only 11, there's 11 people hospitalized for all kinds of reasons, all kinds of different reasons. 11 people hospitalized could arguably not, is not gonna bring help. But it doesn't people. say how many are in the intensive care unit. My concern is intensive care beds and, and the, the type of, of acute care nursing and not having the workforce or a bed for someone who might have a heart attack or be in a terrible accident or something like that. Um, but I do, I think I'll just, you know, say again that I think, you know, we're, we're moving to mass coming up and what can we do to start educating um, people, but we're not at that point yet, is my belief. Okay. Anything else under COVID-19? Uh, just a quick question. I know in January we had 600 new cases and uh, now it is, how many were there, new cases? Jennifer, I, I don't know, you mentioned um, 130? The overnight, 132 new cases. So what was the total then? So in, in isolation right now, mm -hmm. 536. And does that include the 132? Or yes. Yeah, that's, okay, yeah. okay. So it's down, but not significantly down. And positivity, do you have any? I don't know the positivity. Um, the last two weeks ago was 6.27 and the state was 15, but I don't have last week's. But then again, you know, I, I think the positivity, you know, it can get watered down if there's a lot of testing in this community. Yeah. Do we have incident? Do you have any incident rates? The 14 day incidence rate is 77. What was it in August? 1.4. Oh, 1.4. 1. 1. 1. Okay. Yeah. That says yeah. something. And then no, just uh, September 63, January, it was 191. Okay. So the incident rate is significantly up. I think, you know, that the data has shown now that if you are vaccinated and boosted, the chances of your landing in the hospital are, are much lower, maybe 20 times lower, but it also seems like we have like 70 times as many cases going on. So I think eventually we'll get into this balance where that effect on hospitals and medical care will be similar to the way it was in the summer, even though the case numbers may remain some somewhat higher. So I think to look at all, all these things is really important now. It's really a different picture than it was in August. And gosh knows, we don't know what the picture will be in three months either. But, you know, I, I think you need to kind of follow it. And it we might be in a surprising place in four weeks. Who knows? <laughs> The other okay. thing, oh, go on, Lauren. I'm sorry, I just had a question. Didn't the incident um, rate fluctuate? You said it it went up and then it, it got lower again with 77? So. Yes, so it's been, it was climbing then peaked out about January 28th and now yeah. it's, 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 low, it's lower. And I just want to let everyone know that, you know, I look at the CDC site, I'd like to see us, you know, go back to moderate, that yellow color, because we're still high. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, substantial is orange, so if we can get that down. And then we also, we speak um, to Northampton and Hadley, and we see what, you know, the region is doing as well. That's my update. Okay. Thank you. And then um, do you want to talk about Black History Month and the theme of health and wellness? Yeah. So I wanted to talk.
talk about that it's Black History Month and the, the theme this month is health and wellness. And we have um, a few things going on around town, some things planned for the end of the month, the 24th to celebrate it. Um, just outside the health department here, um, we've put up some photographs and things said about Shirley Jackson Whitaker, mm -hmm. um, African-American nephrologist, uh, local, and Dr. Kamara Jones. She's an MD, anti-racist, and an activist. And I think, Lauren, do you have anything you'd like to, to say? Do you want to read um, the racism statement? I wasn't sure you asked to you know, read the first paragraph. Is it yeah, possible for yeah. you to I put it over? I Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, whatever you want to do. Because um, I know you, you had a lot of input on this statement and it's pertinent to this, this month. Sure. Well, first, um, I was looking at um, the website, um, American Public Health Association and their definition of public health. And um, I just wanted to read that and just give, you know, since I'm new on the board, um, remind myself and uh, the public what, you know, public health encompasses. So I'll just read um, the short statement that I put together. It says, according to the American Public Health Association's definition of public health. Public health includes all the organized and holistic efforts to improve policy, education, and access to make the healthiest choice the, the easiest choice. Public health is the work of increasing life expect expectancy, quality of life, and covers social and physical environments, such as where we live, go to school, work, and play. It sets safety standards, protects workers, develops school nutrition programs to ensure children have access to healthy foods, identifies risks and behaviors such as the use of alcohol and tobacco products, sheds light on why some groups are more susceptible to disease, tracks disease outbreaks, seeks to prevent disease, and encourages the development of safe communities. This is why last year the town's Board of Health put together a statement of the connection between racism and health and communities and individuals. We hope to continue to find ways to reach our community so they can understand this connection and take action steps to decrease the harms of racialized health care. Thank you, Lauren. And Lauren um, and I were at the um, town's official raising of the flag for on the first day of, uh, of the month. And um, the town council read um, their whereas statement and um, part of what Lauren worked on was in part of that statement. So it was very nice to know that a board of health member um, had an impact on the town statement. So thank you for that, Lauren. So it was a very nice ceremony. Uh, um, and Jen, I believe you, Lauren, and I are going to be on the February, whatever date, uh, uh, session that Jennifer Moyston is um, organizing. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. I believe it's the 24th, but... Yes. We should probably have some kind of interaction before then. Um, I can send out an email to the two of you. Okay, anything else, Jennifer? That's it, thank you. Okay, I have one topic not anticipated. Um, but let me grab the statement here. Okay, so because of the filing procedures of the town of Amherst rules and regulations governing the subdivision of land. Uh, we received via me um, this whole plan that um, Cinda Jones is subdividing the lots, uh, the lot she has up on 
Shootsbury Road and Market Hill Road. That was the area that she wanted to develop into the solar panels. Um, and then the town is working on a moratorium. And when I first got the message we were getting this and I looked at it, um, she's not my, and when I saw today's Gazette, which Steve also said, she's not subdividing it for building. I believe she's subdividing it to still put solar in there. And Jen is gonna look up and I've looked up that all I could find is that under this section of the filing procedures, the Board of Health has to receive a copy of the plans. So we have a copy of the plans, but no action is being taken per se. Now it has all the geographic and geological pieces on it, um, but it's from what I can tell, it's not being subdivided into housing. Is, is that correct, Jen? I'm sort of te text, I emailed Jen back and forth saying, okay, I looked up this um, filing procedures, but I, I didn't see other than where to receive a copy of this, any action that we there's, need to take. There's no action. That's just a copy for us, but I'll, I'll continue to look and make sure. Okay. And I'll continue correct. to look. Yeah. But I just want you to be aware that we have, and I'm, I'm going to bring those over to you, Jen, because I don't want them sitting in my house. Um, <laughs> the, the the geographic maps for this um, subdivision. Uh -oh. I just we'll have to, for the board's information, a resident contacted me who lives adjacent to, and that person is somewhat concerned about water and what, whether the runoff situation would change, whether it would affect the well that they have. And I, you know, I know we have other ways of dealing with water than the Board of Health, but I just wanted you to know there was some concern about that. And I don't know if it's something we would take up, but it is a concern that, you know, by deforesting this land, which is fully owned by the people who wanted, who wanted to deforest it, it should be their right to do it, I suppose. But uh, by deforesting, you can have a change in the, the way water runs off and uh, might have an impact on right. people nearby. Yeah. And we can watch that because if anyone else is aware, I watched what was happening in Williamsburg when they put in solar panels and they had a huge mess with runoff um, after it was put in in the hills of, of Williamsburg um, and a lot of environmental and geological and water problems. So um, we can act accordingly as this process moves. Okay, so I'm going to open this up for public comment, but first I want to let people know that according to the act extending certain COVID-19 measures of June 16th, uh, 2021, the open meeting law does not require the public bodies to allow comment or public participation during meetings. The manner that the public bodies may choose to accept comment is outside the scope of the open meeting law. So therefore the Amherst Board of Health will allow public comment um, and we have the following guidelines. Residents may make uh, um, public comments up to two minutes during the public comment period. When called on, the resident will state their name, their preferred pronouns and area or district, address or district. Uh, we will be giving priority to Amherst residents than to others who do not reside in the town of Amherst. Um, to be acknowledged, commenters must have their names in their windows, so we have to see your names up on the uh, attendee list, which I see. And the intention of this public comment period is for the Board of Health members to hear comments from the public, but not to engage in discussions or debates. The chair has the right to deem um, commenters disruptive and will end their public comment period. For example, noises, horns, music, etc. And if there are any questions for the health director, she may be reached via email and her contact information can be found on the town's website under, under the health department. So with that, I am going to open public comments and Jen, so, do you want? Yeah, I can, I can, sorry to interrupt. I can um, allow people to talk and introduce them if you want a time. 
Yes, and I will time them. I have my little timer here. Oops, let me get it open. Okay. Okay, so let's see. We have um, Darcy Dumont. Can you unmute? And you have two minutes. Introduce yourself, please. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm Darcy Dumont and I live in District 5. I'm My pronouns are she, her. I'm a member of the Zero Waste Amherst and have been working on reforming the waste hauler system in town so that we can have more services, including curbside compost pickup and basic service, as you all know, um, for the same or less money than what we're paying now to a big national hauler. I'm here tonight to update you on the work of Zero Waste Amherst, uh, the, work, the hauler work group um, since we last um, were here at your January meeting. So, uh, first we, and we wanna thank the board for its statement and support made at your last meeting that has been very helpful in moving the initiative forward. So first I wanna report that as of January 1st, California became the first state to require all individuals and businesses to compost by way of systems set up by each municipality. Since last month, the hauler group has been focused on meeting with the haulers to get input, meeting with other towns that have contracts with a hauler, and getting financial information about those contracts. What we've learned is that folks in South Hadley, uh, where they have a contract, pay an annual waste hauling fee to the town of less than $200 a year for the same services we get here in Amherst for approximately five to $600 a year. Those South Hadley residents do have to pay for their trash bags, but they still end up paying half of what Amherst residents pay a year. South Hadley is served by Republic Services. South Hadley though doesn't provide curbside compost pickup so to find a town that includes that service, we looked at Louisville, Colorado, which is about the same size as Amherst and is also served by Republic. In Louisville, you pay according to the size of your trash toter, small, medium, or large. The residents who use a small 35 gallon toter pay under $200 a year, and there's no additional charge for bags. The more waste you make, the more you pay, but 95% of residents see some savings even including the extra compost pickup of services. Okay, your two minutes are up, Darcy. <laughs> Can I have 30 more seconds? Yes, okay, 30 seconds. We met with USA Hauling and Recycling this week and are meeting with Republic soon to get input about our proposal. It's, we're pushing this program because it'll dramatically reduce waste and help achieve our climate goals. The fact that it will save residents money is just icing on the cake. So we'd be glad to answer any questions and otherwise uh, we'll see you next month with our next update. Okay, thank you for the update, Darcy. Okay, Jen. All right, we have Sean Karana. If you can unmute yourself and pronounce your name correctly, if I did not. Yes, you're spot on with that. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Sean Karana. Um, um, I'm a student at UMass Amherst and I'm a resident of Sunderland. Um, I have a few lingering thoughts and questions about the mask mandate. I had a brief conversation with Jen over email a couple of days ago. Um, so speaking of masks, I feel masks were meant to be a temporary intervention. And once we had the vaccines, we moved away from them. Over the summer, we did not have a mandate. Um, and it's worth noting that over the summer, we did not have any UMass students on campus. So the numbers were obviously going to be low, but then we brought back the mandate and we, and we never rescinded it. And then it, it has been that way in perpetuity. And um, at what point do we say that, okay, enough is enough. We have 88% vaccination rate. Everybody who wants to get a vaccine can go walk into CVS and get one. Um, and um, and I, I know Jen mentioned that during early spring, we're gonna drop the mandate. So what happens next, right? We're gonna have cases go back up. So we're gonna bring the mandates back. And the reason I bring this up is because I feel like based on my like based on what I know and what I've heard from people is that um, the uh, faith of people in public health is eroding because they feel like, OK, why do we even get the vaccine? I got my vaccine. I got my booster. I did all the right things. I'm a senior. This is my last semester on campus. I'm going to be gone. 
I don't remember the last time I saw human faces when I was attending my classes. I go to a classroom, everybody around me is boosted, I am boosted, but that doesn't seem to make a difference. It does like a huge mental toll that's been taken on people, especially when you see that people tend to dehumanize other people for merely showing their faces. Um, hospitalizations, I think on the COVID dashboard of Massachusetts DPH, we know that 50% of them are with COVID, not because of COVID, they're incidental with a variant as such as Omicron, so contagious. Um, you go into hospital, you're tested as a procedure, um, you happen to get tested positive, right? So then- um, Your two the minutes is up. Huh? Can I get Your 30? two minutes is up. Can I get 30 more seconds, please? Okay. Um, so I was gonna wrap it up and I was gonna say that I feel like, so I know Jen mentioned April, but I feel like maybe it should be early March because you look around us, Sweden has declared the end of pandemic. You have um, other or Nordic countries, Norway, Denmark, England, then you have within Massachusetts, you have Malden, um, Lowell, you have, um, 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 you have Salem, you have all these- Your 30 seconds is now up. Okay, sweet, thank you. Thank you. All right, Matthew Lackner, you can pronounce your name correctly and where do you live? Hi, thank you. Um, yes, it's Matt Lackner. I live uh, in District 5 in Amherst Woods and uh, forgive the screaming children in the background if you can see them. Um, I'm here just to urge you to end the mask mandate as soon as possible. Um, it was stated that this policy now is intended to protect children who can't be vaccinated. But I would say that this mask mandate is uh, actively harming small children like my two-year-old who is trying to develop her speech and has to wear a mask all day at daycare. Uh, I think waiting until children under five can be vaccinated makes no sense as a policy for two uh, specific reasons. First, COVID has always been relatively benign for children. The fatality rate for young children is significantly higher from the flu versus COVID. And there's many things in day-to-day -day life we deal with that are more dangerous to children this age than COVID, such as car accidents, drowning, and so many others. I don't think we should all stop driving. I think we should take masks off little kids. Uh, second, masks protect the wearer. So if people are concerned about catching COVID, they can wear a mask. We're not saying people shouldn't wear masks. They can all protect themselves if they want to with masks, but we should let children be on masks. It's time for children to get back to having normal school and a normal life where they don't have to wear masks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Stephen Brevik. You can say your name and where do you live, please? Yes, hi everybody. I uh, my name is Stephen Brevik. It's, it's uh, I live up by Atkins Reservoir. I'm not really sure what district that is, so you'll forgive me. Um, first off, just want to thank all of you guys for being a part of this board. Um, so thank you. Just wanted to offer my perspective as an Amherst resident and as a parent of children at Fort River and as a psychologist here in town. I think I stand for a lot of folks um, in asking that we establish some kind of benchmark for when the mask mandate will eventually drop. Mostly, I guess I have particular concern for the kids in school, just kind of echoing Matt Lactor's statements. Um, my daughter spent more than half of her life in masks. And I'm hoping that the leadership displayed by the state offers guidance for us as a town to be able to consider this option and really just hoping overall that we can get some transparency as far as when this will occur. So if you guys could speak to that at any point during this meeting, um, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Cole Fitzpatrick, if you can state your name and where you live, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. So my name is Cole Fitzpatrick. I live in District 5. I'm the parent of a vaccinated five-year-old at Fort River, as well as a three-year-old in preschool. Um, speaking here in support of re removing the mask mandate, specifically in schools, uh, we're in a very different place than we were in August 2020. Uh, Omicron, while more transmissible, it is less severe than Delta. Children five years and above can be vaccinated. All adults can be boosted. The overall vaccination rate is much higher. And Paxlovid, uh, the Pfizer antiviral, is becoming increasingly available, which will further prevent hospitalizations. 
Um, so regarding schools, children are the least at risk demographic uh, with unvaccinated children facing similar hospitalization risks as boosted adults. Um, by now the risks uh, from COVID to children are known to be minim minimal. Uh, what's unknown are the harms that masks impose on their social and language development, uh, particularly for children learning a second language as my daughter is in the Comandante's program. Um, everyone five years and up has had ample time to get vaccinated and boosted. N95s are readily available for anyone who is vulnerable or still worried about COVID. And after the Omicron wave, we likely have high rate of natural immunity to go with our already high rate of vaccination. Uh, rapid tests are finally available, and that should lessen in-school transmission. Um, I'll just close by saying that for two years, children have bore the brunt of the pandemic. Um, I have a three-year-old who's also been in mass half her life. I'm just asking you tonight to make it stop as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Bridgewater, if you can unmute yourself, state your name and where do you live? Hi, uh, I'm Kathleen Bridgewater and I live in District 2. Um, I I'm going to speak about the issues of public health as they relate to the upcoming uh, solar bylaw. I'm glad to hear that uh, Nancy was mentioning having uh, followed some of the information about what's going on in Williamstown. Uh, there is an Emily Cohen interview uh, about what happened to her land, which you can see on Smart Solar Shootsbury if you go to that website and you can actually see what a disaster has occurred in her backyard. Um, I, the reason why I'm speaking here tonight is that the, the Board of Health really does have a important role to play. And it's, a, it's both important to be knowledgeable about the concerns of solar, uh, ground mounted solar, uh, because legally the Board of Health is in charge of making sure that safety of the, of, of the public is um, taken care of. And what those safety issues are, as, um, was already mentioned by Stephen earlier. One is wells. The people in District 2 who've already had this situation going on for a while, the, the process of looking into it, are all on wells. The whole area is on wells. But it's not just our groundwater that's of concern here, but also the Atkins Reservoir, which is about 50% of the entire town of Amherst water supply. There, there is an intention of putting solar panels right on top of the watershed for the Atkins Reservoir. We are wondering whether or not you are communicating uh, with the boards of health in, in the um, contiguous towns so that whether the Amherst Board of Health is talking to people who are aware of these issues in Shutesbury. But that is that is the public health system, public um, water system there. So there are also concerns uh, about these uh, installations, in particular the one that it was continued uh, has been considered for Shutesbury Road. Will have lots of batteries. These are lithium ion batteries, which um, have been known to. Um, cause fires. Okay, your two I, minutes are up. Can you wrap it up? I, yeah, I will try to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, um, I know. Uh, the issue of fires, the issue of, of, of firefighters having to fight fires, having to do with lithium ion batteries, which are notoriously horrible to put out. And the, and the contamination of the groundwater underneath such a fire were it to occur. Um, there's also the issue of, of um, weed killers that are used because the solar panels can't function if there are weeds growing up around them. So there are many things I hope that the Board of Health will look into and take a role, a very active role in protecting public health as related to all of the issues of solar 
installations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay. All right, Gavin Anderson. You can unmute yourself, state your name and where you live, please. Hi, I'm Gavin Andreessen. I live in District 4 in Amherst and I use he, him pronouns. Um, I tuned in tonight to also urge you to end the mandates on the public. Uh, I think we need to transition. This is going from a pandemic to an endemic and the masks will come off. I think they should come off uh, as quickly as possible, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think one of the reasons that I haven't heard pointed out yet tonight on why uh, mandates on the public should be ended is just to free up resources. You heard tonight at your meeting about um, concerns about masking in restaurants. And I would much, much rather you focus on the vulnerable people in town. So think about uh, ventilation and masking in healthcare settings like nursing homes. I think that's it's so much more important to protect the vulnerable people and just let go of the issue of masking in restaurants and schools. It just isn't important. That is not where the vulnerable, vulnerable people are. And I think it can, it'll be a much better use of your time to focus on those vulnerable people. Thanks, that's all I have to say. Thank you. All righty, Nicholas DeFranco, if you can unmute and tell us your name and where you live. Hello, I'm Nicholas DeFranco. I go to UMass Amherst. Um, I am here also in, su- in support to remove the mask mandate. I struggle to find any reason now in 2022 after the vaccines and boosters are widely available that justifies a mask mandate any longer. We have an 88% vaccination rate in Amherst as per the Amherst Public Health website, which is in the range of herd immunity. Listening to this meeting, one would think we are still in mid-2020 without vaccines and boosters, which I think does not reflect the reality of COVID in February 2022. UMass Amherst contributes to the good-looking vaccination numbers that Amherst has, a campus that has a 98% vaccination rate and probably a similar, similar booster rate as the booster shot was mandated. The vaccines, as we have seen in the past few months with Omicron, do not stop the spread of the virus, but that's okay. The vaccine is effective, the booster shot more so, at protecting against serious illness, hospitalizations, and death. So if almost anyone were to get Omicron, which is 90% less dangerous than Delta, according to a Kaiser Permanente of Southern California study, they will almost certainly not get seriously ill, hospitalized, or die. Also, who cares about the case numbers? It's frankly annoying and unnecessary to keep hearing about case numbers. If everyone at UMass, for example, got COVID, but no one died or was hospitalized, why does that matter? People get sick all the time. The only vulnerable groups are mainly the obese and the elderly. Other groups like the immunocompromised or those with three or more comorbidities are at risk and they can wear a mask if they want to and they should get boosted. 94% of COVID deaths are from those with three or more comorbidities according to a peer reviewed study on The Lancet. To respond to the point of, by the Director of Health claiming that four-month-old to four-year-olds are at risk, that is simply untrue. The death rate of children aged zero to four is a whopping 0.1% over the course of the entire pandemic, which is about 400 children, which is going to be far, far less now that the Omicron is the dominant variant. It's pretty silly to mandate masks for the majority of people who are vaccinated, boosted, who aren't at risk anymore, which is okay. the majority of people in Amherst. Two minutes are up. Can you wrap I, it up? Yes, yes, I have like three sentences left. Um, Stephen made some great points that I echoed in this speech. Um, We are at the point to take these masks off. It's clearly, uh, where is it? Also, I completely agree with Ashan with every point he made. Most importantly, the fact that public health authorities such as yourselves seem to be more concerned with the authority part and not the public health part. Considering that almost everyone that has spoken tonight is against a further mask mandate, Please listen to the science, not your feelings, and take this mask mandate off of Amherst. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And the last person we have is Sharon Keeney. If you can state your name, please, and where do you live? Hi, my name is Sharon Carney, and I live in District 5. I would also like to speak in support of removing the mask mandate. I don't need to repeat what has already been said, I'll just state that I am the parent of a Fort River kindergartner and a three-year-old who is in a preschool town. And 
we are feeling like the masks are causing some adverse effects on their education and their development. So we are also in favor of removing the mask mandate for all the reasons said previously by others. And I'd also like to thank you all for your work on this board. We appreciate the challenges that you were all facing in making these decisions, but please know that there is support in the community for removing masks and for getting kids back to normal, uh, especially for little kids for whom there's very little risk has been stated from COVID and the risks of interfering with their development in terms of language and, and other social emotional development. We are strongly in favor of removing the mask mandate sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Sam has his hand up. Oh, Sam. All right. Sam, you want to state your name? Yeah. Unmute yourself. Yes, this is this is Sammy again. Just can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so just wanted to touch on a few more things. Um, it's pretty uh, overwhelming the support against the mandates. I don't think the term mandate needs to be used. I think guidance could be a better use of words. Um, I think people know and have mitigated their own risks at this point. Um, if they want to go out to a restaurant or to a grocery store or to a big box store in Hadley, they're going to do it with or without a mask or with three or with two or with none. It's time to get back to reality, folks. You guys are on the line for this. There is no state mask mandate except for the schools. And Governor Baker has given you a deadline for that, February 28th. It's on you. I wouldn't be here making noise if you had somewhere to, to basically blame. This is on you as a board. And you need, to, you need to actually make real decisions now because it's your option and your opportunity to do so. Um, not once have any of you pushed vitamin supplementation, vitamin D3, especially in folks that are darker skinned. I haven't heard that from any of you guys. Not once. We've had this conversation, Nurse Brown. Why have you not let people know about other ways to mitigate viral, upper respiratory viral, viral infections? None of you have done it. You've said there's only two ways. There's a mask and there's a vaccine and take it as much as you want. And I'm here to say the vaccine are poisoned. I'm sorry for all of you that took it. You will all find out soon how bad these vaccines are if you haven't figured it out yet. We need to go back to normal. We need to get supplementation. We need to get outside in the sun. We need to go back to living. That's all I got to say to you guys. And I do appreciate your attention. And I know your jobs are hard, but wow, it's time to change course like everyone else did in the last You're, week. Thank you. And your time is up. All right. Okay. Thank you, Sammy. Okay. All right, that's it for hands, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that is our meeting, unless a board member wants to make a comment. I, I would like to just um, say that um, there is an important um, study that was done by the Imperial College of London that shows it's a human challenge program and it showed how COVID spreads and it, it gives a more accurate timeline of the infection that maybe people will want to take a look at. And um, I just, uh, I just, I think that as a board and we listen to the public, we, we are here to, um, you know, serve and protect the, the public um, and not just individuals. And I would just hope that, you know, we as a board make decisions for, you know, the public as a whole and not just for, you know, individual opinions ourselves or, or individual individuals in the in in Amherst. And I don't know if this is a good time but if it's possible i would like to know more about the water the, the water wells and the other committees is it possible to invite them 
to our next board meeting to find out more about, you know, the solar um, installations that, you know, have come up in the town council and in, in public conversation. Um, and just to get like a better understanding of like how the, the water system in Amherst works. Um, I would like to know if we could invite some committees like the um, the Water Supply Protection Committee or the Water Department. Okay, thank you, Warren. We'll see what we can do. Um, without any, oh, we have, there is one more hand, uh, Eric Backrock. Should we let him speak? I didn't see his hand before. They weren't, they weren't up, but do you want me to allow them? Um, Nicholas spoke, uh, let Eric speak and then we'll. All right, so Eric Backrock, if you can pronounce your name correctly and tell us where you live, please. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, it's Eric Backrock. He, him, I live at Shoot, on Shootsbury Road in Amherst. And what prompted my last second uh, decision to raise my hand was what Lauren, Lauren's request to, to bring in other committee members. It was, in fact, the Water Supply Protection Committee meeting last week um, that, was, um, uh, that was confronting the three parcels um, in the water, Amherst watershed that flows into the Atkins Reservoir that is in Shootsbury. And they're beginning to kind of deal with the consequences, understand what the potential consequences are. And when you clear cut that much um, forest and uh, in water, watershed uh, protected areas. Um, at, that, at that meeting, I asked uh, the uh, water supply Protection Committee, a general question. Um, their jurisdiction is the public water supply. Um, being on Shootsbury, living on Shootsbury Road, our ju you, the jurisdiction for our safe drinking water is the Board of Health. And I was referred to the Board of Health when I asked, how can we ensure that this, the, the water supply for all Amherst residents is protected? I would say that um, I've lived here since 1985, and everybody on in in the neighborhood has wells. Our well was quite deep; it's over almost 400 feet deep. If you know anything about wells, um, when I say the flow rate is low, I would it. Our flow rate is three gallons a minute, which really is we've run out of water a few times over the years but we've really had wonderful water generally. I'm concerned as many of my neighbors are with what happens when you take, uh, take the, uh, the, the what, may, what keeps the watershed, a watershed protected area. Your two minutes are up, Eric. Do you have one other word you wanna say? I, I could have many words to say now. Okay. <laughs> I'll stop there, but I-, okay. I will take the matter of uh, the uh, clean drink, drinking water, safe drinking water, our safe safety, health, and welfare under under uh, a real concern. Okay. Because, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your service to the town. Okay. Thank uh, you. Okay. No more comments. Um, and uh, I'll vote for adjournment. Our next meeting is March thirteenth. Um, and may I have a motion to adjourn? <coughs> so moved. Maybe March 13th? Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. March 13th? What no. is today? It's a uh, March 10th. Sorry, March 10th. I wrote it down. Yeah. March 10th. Thank Disorder. you for picking up on that. Thank you for picking up on that. Um, so March 10th. Sorry. March 13th okay. is right. Sunday. Thank you for picking up on right. <laughs> So we have a motion to uh, close the meeting, adjourn, and it 
Uh, need a second? Uh, I'll second it then. Okay. <laughs> um, in favor, Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Lauren? Aye. Steve? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. So thank you all for your work and see you March 10th. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.